Hi, welcome to my channel. My name is Maria. Welcome to Mosaic Maria. So I was just making a video about the Menendez brothers and I saw the breaking news from yesterday after I made my video, so I want to update it. So I wanted to talk about the Menendez brothers and the Netflix series, The Monsters, and also the docudrama that came out from the Menendez family and Lyle and Eric. So quick background if you don't know about the Menendez brothers. When Eric Menendez was 18 and his brother Lyle was 21, they slaughtered their parents, murdered them in their Beverly Hills mansion, the Menendez mansion, while they were eating ice cream and watching TV. So the parents had settled in for a movie night and a bowl of ice cream and one was kind of half asleep, falling asleep. And they charged into the living room and they shot them at close range in a mafia gang style type of murder where they made sure to make it look like their father was being chased by some shady people in the upper Hollywood music cable business that he was in. And uh, they really got away with it. They did this on August, at the end of August, 1989, and it wasn't until the following March that they were brought in to justice. And uh, the way they were brought in to justice was a therapist that Eric had uh, tape recorded Eric confessing that his brother and him had killed their parents. So there's a whole lot of ironies in the self-defense and defense. They had one trial. It was hung. It was a hung trial. They had to do it over again. They they were totally hung or deadlocked. It was split down the middle. Um, the men uh, didn't believe the boys' stories. The the women did. Their defense was called imperfect self-defense. They claimed that their parents had abused them sexually and physically. Um, and up to that point, they hadn't even known of how long each other had been abused because they were very isolated from each other in the abuse. They were each told, don't tell, especially don't tell this one or that one. So there was just this whole cycle of abuse going uh, on in this family. It was really very horrific and horrible. And the main abuser, the dominant abuser would have been the father, Jose Menendez, who was a big wig, a big RCA executive. Also, he uh, was a leader uh, of Hertz and knew people like O.J. Simpson, uh, was involved with like Barry Manilow, Dolly Parton. Um, he helped to form the Menudo brothers and he was venturing out into cable TV um, all the networks that were coming up in the early 90s and putting together boy bands and going to start venturing into movie scripts and all kinds of stuff. And these boys didn't need anything. The Menendez brothers grew up with everything they needed on like Silver Spoon. There you have it. Gucci watches, cars, um, all the fine schools, tutors, maid housekeepers, everything, boats, you name it, they had it. Um, and Eric and Lyle played tennis, and so uh, they had personal coaches, they had, I mean, there's just a lot. Their father, they wanted for nothing, but their father, allegedly, their father molested them, raped them, and, and kept the, and, and this is, you find this in abuse families where a parent is abusing, is a parent might start with one child to a certain age and then flip to another child and never the two meet because the one child is told, your brother won't believe you. You don't tell your brother, you don't tell your sister, you don't, there's like this mutual knowledge of there's abuse in the household or dad's going to get really mad if I do this or mom's going to flip out and not be there if I'm at... the, the siblings have this common knowledge 
but they don't know the details. They think they're the only one. So what happened was uh, Lyle had gone off to Princeton and moved to New Jersey, and he was the older brother, and uh, Eric was going to uh, begin starting college at UCLA, and his plan was to finally get free of his dad and mom, especially his dad, who was abusing him, the main dominant abuser, get out of the Menendez mansion and live at the dorm at college. And his father last minute informed him, you're not going to be on the dorm, in the dorm. I'm gonna get you an apartment off campus and you're gonna be in an apartment. But meanwhile, Eric had been abused from his father, raped, sodomized, raped, humiliated. There was a lot of sadistic, painful behavior that went on from the father to the son. And that started when he was five, he reports, till he was 18. So he was 18 then. And he believed it was going to continue. Both brothers believed that if they told each other or anyone, they were going to be killed. That their father would kill them. That their mother and father knew uh, and they would kill them. So Eric had no one to confide in. He had been writing to a cousin and telling him when he was younger, this happened and does your dad do this? And does he touch your uh, penis? And does, does he, would, does your dad do this and that? And the cousin was like, no, I don't know. I mean, no, no, definitely not. And, you know, you need to tell someone. <laughs> Eric's like, I'm telling you. And uh, that was, that testimony of the letter writing was never let into the second trial. So the first trial, all the abuse was there. They called it the abuse excuse. The men believed the boys slaughtered their parents for greed and revenge, and they were just sociopathic murderers. And they were really good actors, and they were really good storytellers, but this could not happen to men. And these men were very fit, handsome. They showed up with cashmere sweaters in court every day or vests and ties. They, they were very put together. But when their defense attorney, Jill Lansing for uh, Lyle and Leslie Abramson for Eric, uh, questioned them, they really were able to go to the details with a lot of disassociating, dissociating through it. They were able to recount everything. And it was really hard to listen to. It was a lot of graphic, sadistic, horrific abuse that went on for a long time for Eric. So Eric was the most abused is what generally is agreed upon. And Lyle's abuse went on from five to around eight is what he remembers. And he told a female cousin, and the cousin confronted his mother, Kitty. And then it ended. And then it began to be more verbal abuse and threats and emotional abuse and controlling behavior, but not the sexual behavior ever again. Then he actually, as he was growing up, he molested his brother, Eric. And he admits to that, and it's very dramatic in the first trial. He apologizes from the stand. He breaks down. He says, to Eric, I'm sorry I did that. I did to you exactly what Dad did to me. And it's, it's a lot to take in. And the woman believed the boys. The men did not. So it was a deadlocked jury. They had the same judge for the second trial, which was, the first trial was in 1993. Parents were murdered in 1989. First trial was in 1993. The second trial was in 1996. There was a lot going on. The Rodney King riots had just happened. O.J. Simpson. There was a lot going on where there was a feeling that 
the bad guys were being let off and they needed a win. The prosecution needed a win. So they did not let the abuse into the second trial. Although I don't know, this is what I've always thought is, well, everyone says, and right now there's a big move with the TikTok generation, trying to look at this case from a trauma-informed approach, which says, you always believe a person that says it, they wouldn't lie about it. And because they weren't fully brain developed because their brain gets stunted during trauma, that's why Eric has all the disabilities he has, that's why he stuttered, that's why he couldn't answer questions well, that's why he had dyslexia, that's why, well, sometimes trauma can cause that, but not all the time. So the trauma-informed approach, I have a little bit of an issue with because it it, it gives a lot of meaning to um, what always may not be. So two things can be going on at once, can't be all one thing. So a person could have learning disabilities and then also have had trauma and that doesn't mean it was from the trauma. Also, um, I just think that we know now that people do lie about abuse. And I will go out there and just say all we have to do is look at Amber Heard's case and Johnny Depp and I choose to believe Johnny Depp over Amber Heard. So we know that sometimes victims allegedly can lie or add on, add detail, add to their story so and, and make their story more. So I've been talking about this for years out here, post-traumatic stress, support groups, awareness movements, and how people tend to compare notes and add on to their story and say, oh yeah, he did that with me. Oh yeah, I was in that room. I wonder if that happened to me. I felt that way too. So things can escalate. So I always look at these things very cautiously because again, I just want to re just want to remind people I've been out here since 2009 sporadically sharing my story um, and recovery and how I was diagnosed with multiple personality disorder, what it was called then in 1986, how I went to therapy from 1986 all the way to 2015 and literally lost my life. My children, the secondary survivors lost their life. Uh, part of my family rearranged and lost part of their life to, to all come together. It, it just destroys families. So you really have to be careful who you tell, when you tell, how you disclose, and be careful that you're not so much into the recovery process that you're adding on or you're letting anyone lead you or going down the rabbit hole. Okay, so during this time period, Leslie Abramson, who is Eric Menendez's uh, lawyer, was not very well liked. Unfortunately, she just wasn't the at, the men didn't like her, and the woman felt that they may have lost the case because the the men didn't like her. She was a very forward woman, and she kind of had this matronly uh, caretaking and uh, directing of Eric that could be seen as leading him into storytelling of abuse. So what I wanted to concentrate on in my video was in the series Monsters in episode five, it is called The Hurt Man. And Eric goes on to explain to Leslie Abramson when he's recounting the abuse that there is no Eric. He is called The Hurt Man. And he has been the hurt man since as long as he can remember, and he will always be the hurt man. And you get the feeling they're going to try to go down that path with dissociating and that he created another person. He says he doesn't know who Eric is. He doesn't know if he's gay. He doesn't know if he has AIDS. He'll never know who Eric was because Eric never got a chance to live. And he has always forever been the hurt man. And he will always be the hurt man. Um, she goes on to ask him, did you name yourself this when you were a child? Who is the hurt man? I am the hurt man. He... So there's little facets of that in 
the monsters in episode five, I do want to mention in episode five, that was very well done in one take, one shot, that's it, one take. So Cooper Koch played Eric and uh, the name is escaping me for the actress, I'll list it, who played Leslie Abramson, but they rehearsed it a lot and then they just went in and just did it. And it's a very profound, difficult uh, bunch of script that they had to do and they did it all in one take. Um, what I liked about the monsters is that they, I commend them for looking at the generational cycle of abuse and take trying to take a look at the parent's life, not as an excuse, but how Jose, according to the family, because it runs very close to truth, how the family knew that even Jose had been abused by many people that his mother had in the life, uh, in, in their life when they were in Cuba, Havana and Cuba, Cuba Havana, Havana, Cuba. And uh, so he, he kind of comes to a reckoning where he calls his mother and he says, remember when I told you I was gonna tell you what you did to hurt me so bad? So he has this moment where he realizes he is hurting his sons and his sons are now old enough to tell on him and to destroy everything he's built in America. He's a big RCA person. He's got a mansion. He's got everything. These kids got everything they need and it can all just blow up. So he keeps them in check by threatening to kill them. So they go with this imperfect defense saying, the boys believed that the minute they told each other or confronted their parents or anyone, they were going to be killed by Jose in some way. Either shot or thrown off the boat they were on. So the, the, the boys have always said they didn't plot for years to kill their parents. They didn't come up with a perfect plan. They didn't really know what they were doing. They knew to go get guns. They knew to get ammunition. They knew to charge in and kill their parents and make it look like the mafia killed them. They were really particular and they picked up every shell. They're, they shot their parents 18 times. I think the mother was 18 times and she and they went out of the house and reloaded and came back and made sure the mother was dead because she was still alive and in what capacity she could fighting to live still and crawling and begging and they made sure she was dead. Lyle did that. And then they, then he made sure uh, the father was dead. So a lot of people believed at the time, I remember talking about this case with people and it was 1989 and I had just uh, graduated from a social work program and all during that time I had gone to a therapist and all through the trial and there were so many weird things that happened. Had these boys probably gone to a priest and said, I killed my parents, they probably would have gotten away with murder. But they went to a very, uh, a therapist that was very strange. Eric went to a therapist that was his for panic attacks that he had been having and depression and anxiety. And he, uh, told them he went in October 31st so the parents were murdered August end of August Eric goes to see his therapist Dr. Ozeal Jerome Ozeal and tells him my brother and I killed my parents and Dr. Ozeal tape record, asks to have Lyle come back can we call up Lyle and have him come in and validate, confirm what you're saying. And Eric says, sure, and they, Lyle goes in. But now the doctor t records them. And Lyle is very upset. His brother he has now told a doctor. The doctor conjures up in his head that he's going to record them and keep the tapes. I believe 
I've always believed Dr. Ozeal was going to use those tapes to bribe the Menendez brothers for every little penny he could get forever. Uh, but he goes and he gives the tapes to a former ex-patient of his who is also his mistress. And because of the way he's treating her, he says, keep this for safekeeping. And he has her come in and listen, uh, like in the lobby, in the office, to the boys. He safeguards the tapes where she is. And then at one point when he realizes Lyle is very upset for Eric telling the doctor, he gets this, he, he tells the court the reason he uh, recorded them was in case anything happened to him. He had another safe where he wrote, if, if I'm found dead, because these were, they had slaughtered their parents, they could slaughter anyone. So in case something mysterious happens to me, here's the tapes of them confessing. So he wasn't meaning to break patient confidentiality. He was going to keep their secret. But if he felt like his life was in imminent danger, so same as the Menendez brother, he felt like his life was in imminent danger, imperfect self-defense. So he was going to record them and then also give the tapes to his girlfriend and then tell his wife and kids, go get away from the house because they know where, just take a vacation somewhere, go somewhere because they know where we live. And then go stay with his girlfriend and then continue to abuse her, drug her, rape her, physically keep her against her will there and threaten that he will have her committed if she says anything. So when he, he's finally gone, like in March, she finally gets herself together enough to go to the police with the tapes. And that is what brings the Menendez brothers in. So there's, there's so much strange stuff that happens in this case, I can't even begin to cover it all. I won't. <laughs> I won't. There's so much out there in the media. So the TikTok Nation, a lot of young lawyers and people have said, legal eagles have said, wait a minute. The first trial was correct. But we now know in society that boys can be abused and they can act handsome, perfectly fit together and never tell. Because the men were like, well, why wouldn't they tell somebody? Why wouldn't they tell somebody? Well, Eric was telling his cousin. Right up to three months before the murders, Eric was saying it's still happening. He was writing letters back and forth. Lyle had told a cousin. Um, and then Eric told his doctor. So they just didn't allow that in in the second trial. And the second trial, they wouldn't allow any of the abuse testimony from the family any of the documentation, the letter to the cousin, none of it. So, not even how Dr. Ozeal kind of plotted on his own to be safe because Eric confessed this. So now we're going to get Lyle to come in. You're both going to confess together, tell me the whole story. And now, now I'm afraid of you. So that's he did a lot of crazy stuff. He his um, he had relations with other patients. His license was had to be surrendered. He settled with in court with, I believe her name was um, Judalyn Smith. Out of court, he settled for a whole bunch of money. His insurance company settled. So I just always thought, had Eric gone to a priest, it probably would have, they would have been out living their life. Anyways, um, there's these two things going on right now and breaking news as of yesterday these two things in the media the monsters and the docudrama on netflix and everyone's talking about it and so there's been this call for a resentencing or 
not like a real retrial, but to look at their sentence. They've been in jail for, what, 34 years now? They've been perfect role model uh, citizens in the jails. Uh, they've started programs for abuse. They've done charitable work. They've graduated from college, and they've gotten married and uh, been really just golden prisoners. They've never been violent. There are no danger to anyone. So I think what the TikTok Nation is saying is because they were abused, it was okay that they killed their parents because their brains would, Lyle would have had a trauma reaction to Eric uh, disclosing that he was abused. So basically, Eric, Lyle comes home from college for a weekend, and they're supposed to go out on the weekend on the boat and be together and Eric says I'm not gonna be at the dorm in college dad's not gonna let me go and then he tells Lyle dad's been abusing me sexually from five years old and it's still going on and it's gonna continue to go on if I go to that apartment he's gonna have access to me if he puts me in that apartment Lyle is triggered back because they start comparing notes. When Eric is telling him what he did to him, he remembers, wait, that's what Dad did to me. He used pins on you, the headboard, the kneeling, the bathroom, the bedroom, the after, after tennis massages, The it started. They really get into the nitty-gritty of comparing notes, which siblings usually don't do until one says something so that's exactly natural what they did but it I could see how it could trigger Lyle to go into being a more of a leader and older what are we going to do now what are we going to do we've got to get rid of them because they're going to kill us so the imperfect self-defense was in their mind they had been told so many times if you tell, you're dead. So Lyle decides we're going to confront our parents. They go and they confront. This is their story. They go and confront Kitty and Jose. And Kitty admits that she knows, that she knew. There's some conversation that goes on between Lyle. And you knew. You knew. Because cousin so-and-so told you. So you knew but you didn't protect Eric. And she's like, yeah, I know. So that's their story, is that the mother was, in an overt way, not protecting, being a uh, covert way, being negligent and not present for them, and pill-popping, and they show uh, Kitty, and this, this is actual notes, that a doctor had, which I think is crazy that after a person is dead that they can recount this, but Kitty went to a therapist and basically told the therapist in a in a weak moment that she just hated her kid. Like, like just I can't stand my kids. I hate my kids. Like they're parasites. They pull, they take, they drain. Nothing is enough. They're I'm afraid of them. I don't want them, I don't want to be with them in the house. They're going to hurt me. So she's going to a therapist saying, they're going to hurt me. Um, she describes Eric as just pathetic. And Lyle is just a greedy, nasty, horrible person that is dangerous. And meanwhile, the boys do get involved in robberies on the street. There's a lot of stuff they do, behaviors, that are like deviant behaviors that Jose kind of buys them out of and he's he's always going to them saying you're bringing shame on my family you're making me have to get you out of trouble Lyle plagiarizes in college in Princeton plagiarizes and he has to go get him out of school like he's expelled from school he can't go back and until like I don't know a year or something or whatever he buys them back in. Um, there's just so much to this story. And so 
Tic Tac Nation really kind of did like a free Britney movement. And Rosie O'Donnell, I believe, is involved with her Outward uh, podcast, I believe it's called Outward. I might have that wrong. She's been podcasting and doing the talk show Junket. She was on News Nation, I saw her. She was on CNN, I saw her. She's been making the rounds. And she's been in touch with the Menendez brothers and uh, really trying to inform people that, you know, for boys, they were told they would not be believed. They were supposed to be manning up all the time, which I don't even know what that term means anymore. Um, but they were not to be believed in that time in society, but now we know different. So should we really let them go and say, okay, you, because you were model prisoners, even though you slaughtered your parents and you planned it over a four-day period where you were in a trauma response, you were being reactivated by trauma, triggered by Eric, told, Eric finally told his brother, now you confronted your parents, Pandora's out of the box, you dropped the bomb, everything blew up, now the parents said, we're going to kill you. So they had this thought that the parents were going to shoot them, throw them over the boat, have somebody come after them, blow up their car, whatever, anything. They were in imminent danger. That was the defense. Didn't work. Worked for the doctor. The doctor thought he was in danger now that he had the confession because he saw Lyle getting a little agitated, like, hmm, now what do we do? Eric told the doctor, supposedly, that, uh, but he didn't record that, that, uh, oh, yeah, we, like, the doctor wanted insurance that he was safe, and Eric said, well, uh, like, asking him something like, how did Lyle react after, you know, knowing, and he said, well, you know, he said he was angry with me for telling you he said, now we have to kill the doctor. And then he laughed. Like he said, no, like he laughed. So that that was the threat. Like, now we have to kill the doctor. So there's so many weird points in this. But now the district attorney in Los Angeles, uh, attorney George Gascon, says that, and I'm reading this from... ABC News uh, that he'll have made a decision by the end of this week um, regarding the Menendez brothers definitely by the end of this week so Friday news comes after weeks of renewed attention to the high profile case thanks in part to the release of Ryan Murphy's drama series The Monsters uh, the Lyle and Eric Menendez stories he did Jeffrey Dahmer's story, Dahmer, was the first series, and then uh, the second was the Menendez stories, and a documentary about the brothers on Netflix. So if you're going to watch it to catch up to date with the news now, watch the docudrama with the monsters. I would say episode five is the most, well, the beginning, the recounting of the murders is very hard. It's hard series to watch uh, but it's the most close detail and the most true of any of the stuff like the Lifetime TV movies and all the things you've seen over the years and the books and the exaggeration even the book that Lyle Lyle had a woman write a book and uh, he's on tape saying stuff that made the men in the first trial believe they were just greedy little bastards that wanted their parents dead. They, they, their parents were trying to micromanage their money spending, and uh, nothing was ever good enough. The father bought Lyle a car. He wanted a better car. So the prosecution painted a picture of the father was trying to teach them the value of a dollar, not just to be rich, spoiled kids. And they were angry with their parents because every now and again, Jose would say, you're out of the will. That's it. You're out of the will. So what the boys knew was they, they were definitely getting insurance money, but they thought they were out of the will. So they were spent, and they thought they would be caught. They were kind of surprised they weren't caught over and over again. Like when they came back to the house, they were shocked that nobody was there. 
that's when they decided to make the 911 call. The other thing that is a red flag for me and was weird was the 911 call. Lyle makes it, and he's he, he doesn't think he's going to have to make it because when they come back to the house, after cleaning up and going away for a while to make an alibi and make sure all the shell casings are picked up, when they come back, they're just like, oh my God, nobody's here, nobody... Nobody heard all the gunfire. Nobody saw us leave. Nobody. Nobody. Now what do we do? So the 911 car call from Lyle starts off something like, police, police, not very, just very calm. It isn't until they're back in the house and Eric is going back and realizing, oh, look at mom, look at dad. He's reliving it and seeing it. He starts totally freaking out. He's going back towards the body. And you can hear in the 911 call, Eric in the background saying, oh my God, look at mom, look at mom, look at mom. And he walked, he left when Lyle went back to reload and shoot the mother to make sure she was dead in the face. He had Eric leave. So now they're coming back and they're seeing their dead parents an hour later and or an hour and a half later, almost two. And Eric is it's hitting him. And Lyle is reacting to Eric crying and breaking down and he's that's when the 911 call starts to escalate. He sees his brother breaking down. He's like, Eric, no, no, no. Get away from her. Eric, get away from him. Don't go in there. Eric, no, no, Eric, don't. And meanwhile, the 911 operator is trying to figure out, wait a minute, somebody shot your parents? Are they still there? Are they there? He's like, yes, yes, no, no. He's like, <laughs> he's all over the place in this 911 call. And then he regresses to like a child, like, like he, they realize, we really did it. We really did it. And the police never suspect them. They go for months with nobody knowing who did what, just some shady people. They even go so far as to Lyle has a bodyguard he hires, a tennis coach, he buys a restaurant, he buys real estate, um, parties it up. Gucci watches, cars, really high-end, beautiful cars. And they become like movie stars. They're everywhere. And nobody could believe, and nobody's even looking at the Menendez brothers until Dr. Ozeal's mistress, Judith uh, Smith, gives the tape recordings to the police in March. Then they go and they pick up Lyle, who doesn't really resist, and they bring Eric back from Israel where he is a pro tennis player because he's been uh, being coached by a tennis player. So things that people agree upon is Eric was more abused. Eric was more hurt. He was the hurt man. And that Eric, by telling Lyle, triggered Lyle into plotting the murder and that Eric was kind of going along with it because Eric looked up to his older brother and always wanted to make his older brother proud and be like him because the father compared them. And uh, that they were acting in those four days in a culmination of years of abuse. Um, so what I really commend the, uh, the monsters uh, for story for doing Ryan Murphy is to look at the entire generational uh, cycle of abuse, the kind of like the real cultural racism that Kitty's family had, what they thought, and and their life in the, um, Jose's life in Cuba. It I think it's important that the Menendez family, both Kitty's family and Jose's, got a chance to really talk in this documentary, and they they want them released. 
They want them released. They said they, they do know they were abused. They know Jose was abused. They know. And interestingly, Lyle and Eric both agree that they kind of like to think of their father as in heaven looking down at them and saying, well done. Or, you finally did it. I'm proud of you. And him not having all that trauma, pain, that made him revisit it on his children. Like, he is free of that, and he's not in agony, and he doesn't have to hurt his boys because he was hurt. So, it's a weird uh, that, that now he's okay, and he's actually happy they killed him. But that's, you know, you do things to get through it in your mind. is, And one other poignant part was I remember seeing Leslie Abramson on the Larry King show interviewed. Um, and they talked about that, you know, the men didn't like her in the trial. And they thought that she was leading Eric into all the minutia and the horror horrible detail of the story and even like leading him into detail that wasn't there so they so she was being very cautious and then also that um eric had actually told her like he wanted to, she wanted to know how he was doing in jail and she saw that he was adjusting very well and uh although he wanted to get out and everything he was very well adjusted and when she asked him about that he said he finally had peace whereas he wasn't afraid had he gone to the apartment or lived at the mansion and not gone to college and gone to the apartment he would forever be afraid of his father and he had never known a time when he felt safe and he felt safe in prison and cared for so it's interesting. Um, the other thing is that Eric Menendez said that he um, believed if he didn't get out soon, he, he probably had a shorter, he probably wouldn't live as long as Lyle. So something might be going on. They're both married. I said that. I don't know if Eric has health issues, but he is on medication, so something is going on there. Um, but the news comes after weeks of renewed attention to the high-profile case. Uh, thanks to Ryan Murphy's series um, and the TikTok Nation, who is now looking at this from a trauma-informed approach, which says, well, that's what abused kids would do. <laughs> and this imperfect self-defense. Um, and basically, the prosecutors contended that the murders were committed out of greed. The defense attorneys argued that the killings were in self-defense following the brothers' allegations that they were sexually and physically abused by their father. Claims that the prosecutors cast as fabrication in the original trial. After a mistrial in the proceedings, the brothers were convicted in a second trial in which their defense attorneys saw evidence of abuse was excluded. They weren't allowed to bring the abuse in at all. Gascoigne said that his office is split. And this is just the irony of it. His office is split over whether or not they believe the claims. So we're right back to deadlocked. I have a group of people, including some that were involved in the original trial, that are adamant that they should spend the rest of their life in prison and that they were not molested. Gascoigne said, Gascoigne. I have other people in the office that believe actually that they probably were molested and that they deserve to have some relief. He said that he has been looking into the case for a year now and plans to make a decision by the end of the day on Friday. He said that the renewed interest in the case has spurred his decision-making process along. The Menendez brothers appellate attorneys filed a habitus, I'm saying that wrong, I never say it right. Sorry. Um, petition in May 2023 citing new evidence. A letter from Eric Menendez to a relative in which he detailed the alleged abuse by his father 
to challenge the convictions. That was when he wrote to his cousin, but they wouldn't let it in. Uh, and he, his cousin was in the first trial, but they wouldn't let him in the second trial. The district attorney said he is reviewing the letter along with the abuse allegations against Jose Menendez made by Roy Rosello, a former member of the boy band Menudo. So if you remember the boy band that Ricky Martin was in, and this is what Jose did. He put together bands. He wanted to put together more Latino bands. He's saying he was abused in the mansion at a young age the same way the boys were. The, he's describing the same thing. And he's giving details that nobody would know but the boys. So, and never was said out loud to anyone or a book or anything. So, former member of the boy band Menudo. The band had a recording contract with RCA Records where Jose Menendez worked as an executive. Um, so, he says that he's been looking into the case for a year now. He plans to make the decision Friday, blah, blah, blah. This is going to, I can never say that word. Um, it was, okay. Um, so there was new evidence given by appellate attorney Cliff Gardiner. So that all went in in May 2023. The letter detailing the alleged abuse to the family member, the cousin who is now dead, unfortunately, sadly, was first discovered and also referred to similar allegations made by Roy Rosello on the boy band. So, uh, I heard Rosie O'Donnell on News Nation. I thought it touched something in her where she understood the isolation between siblings of talking about the abuse and how this could go on for so many years with Eric and Eric never told Lyle and how Lyle could have just shut it off kind of when, when it stopped and then just went into this deviant kind of behavior where I'm just going to act out, be bad at school, I'm going to uh, cheat on my grades, I'm going to plagiarize, I'm going to not like anything you do, I'm going to be sarcastic to you, whatever, whatever his mother was complaining about and his father was saying was bringing shame to the family. So in grades, it was considered they were in grades, they were greedy, uh, they may have been sociopathic, but they wanted freedom to spend the money. Um, but now they don't. So again, it, it, now it was all about the abuse. I, th I think it's very hard line to teeter on because what are we saying? And it reminds me of the Gypsy Rose case. Okay, so what are we saying? If your parent says enough times, I'm going to kill you. And those of us that are survivors, we know all the crazy, crazy shit that parents say when they're molesting you and abusing you. If you tell, I'll, if you tell, I'll kill myself. If you tell, I'll kill your father. If you tell, I'll hurt your brother. If you tell, I'll say you're nuts. If you tell, I'll commit you. If you tell, I'll do this. Nobody will believe you. Go ahead, try to tell. That's what triggered me in the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp case. Triggered me so bad, I was like for days thinking, go ahead, Johnny, tell. Oh my God. They won't believe you. I think every child or person that is abused, domestic, anything, are told, go ahead. Don't have to believe you. Try. So you have to get a person in a really rundown state to say nobody's going to believe you. So um, I found the monsters very hard to watch. I found episode five, the hurt man, the most, the one I keep going back to and thinking, what was Le Leslie Abramson going to go for had they not? Had they not said, you're leading, you're, you're, 
you're caretaking, you're leading him in a direction of uh, storytelling of abuse. Would she have gone for a, at the time, DID defense, which it would have been dissociative identity disorder, where Eric ha had alter split, Eric, there was no Eric, Eric didn't know who he was, he never got a chance to develop, he had alter aspects that were all fragmented, you don't know. So um, I thought I would bring that out because I always talk about what's in the media that might be, that is having to do with sexual abuse, that is also having to do with post-traumatic stress, and certainly having to do with dissociating, which you can go back and look at the actual testimony from the real trials, and you can see examples of Lyle, if you're interested, dissociating on the stand, you can actually see Eric dissociating on the stand recounting stuff. So um, not going off into another personality that we know of or uh, no, none of that, but definite the features of dissociation you can see. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. I wish everyone well in jail or out of jail. I guess I have sat on the fence with this from 1989. I've flip-flopped what is the message we're saying you've you got a you served enough time but I, I mean I think it I think they've served a lot of time when you couple it with a lifetime of abuse you're gonna have people that say they had a lifetime of privilege along with the abuse so I, I just thought I'd come out and make a video and say we'll find out on Friday and uh, I think they've served enough time. I think if they were model prisoners, they're not a menace to society or violent. They've contributed. I think they should be released. And I'm not saying that anyone should ever kill anyone that abused them or has a right to, but I think they should be released. Okay. That's all I got. Have a nice day. Let me know what you think. I really want to hear what you think. I haven't done a video in a long time, so I'd like to know what your thinking is on this. Thanks. Have a nice day. Bye.